Shalom and welcome to another edition of Our Daily Bread. I'm Messianic Torah and this week's parashah is the sixth parashah of the book of Vayikra, also called Leviticus, and it's called Akrimot, which means after the death. Now normally uh, we do uh, the two parashahs together, like the dual parashahs, Akrimot, Kedoshim, um, but then every third year you do just the individual uh, parashahs there themselves. So this is one of those years. And so we have just Akrimot this time. And um, this parashah starts in Leviticus 16.1 through 18.30 and the half Torah is in Ezekiel or Yeheskel 22 verse 1 through 19. And my message for 2013-14 is called Careful with Life. And this message, by the way, uh, funny story about this message, I recorded this message once and then realized that I hadn't hit the record button uh, and I didn't realize that till after I was done recording, so I lost that recording. And then I've been having trouble with my um, sound on my computer and, and the sound card and stuff. And so I had gotten the other one and I was determined to get one uh, before the end of Shabbat since I had spent all that time and essentially wasted that whole time where it didn't record anything. And so then I recorded it again. And then when I went to post it, since I do these a week in advance, um, I went to post it on Shabbat, or Rev Shabbat, and realized that the sound wasn't working. There was no sound recorded. So, drats, I was foiled again. And so this is the third time with this message. And uh, I'm really hoping that once I'm an hour deep and I've explained things and I've used examples, just from the top of my head, I can't replace those because it wasn't like I'm reading off a cue card or something. So can't recreate the same message twice. And so we hope that this recording goes through. That being said, uh, my message is called Careful with Life. And this week's parasha, it starts off, we we start with this concept of you know, Yorewahe telling Moshe to tell Aharon not to come into the holy place at any time, lest he die. And, of course, we just had the incident with Nadav and Avihu, his sons, being killed. We dealt with all of that, and now he's told not to come into the holy place at all times, lest he die. You see, this goes to one of the fundamental understandings that we get one of the patterns that we plainly see over and over again in the Torah which is that those things that draw near to Yorewahe are in danger okay Yorewahe is holy and once you draw near to him you're putting your life in danger I mean even when we see the story of Esther uh, we see the danger that you could be put to death if you come before the king um, anytime you're before a king, every word that you say, one misword or misdeed uh, through thousands of years of history has caused people to get killed on the spot. Now if that's for earthly kings, how much more so the king of the universe? Um, and I think the reason I bring that up is because people aren't careful with Yorewahe, I think, uh, in my opinion. You know, we get all these things like, oh, you know, you're going to go boldly to the throne and, you know, you're going to go up and, and, and just, you know, be able to spend time with God and, oh, how great it's going to be. You know, come Mashiach now. We want him back now. It's, it's, a, it's a, around the time of Passover. You have people, you know, opening the door. Oh, I hope Elijah comes, you know, made a seat for him. And I don't think people understand what they're saying or what they're doing. Um, Elisha the prophet, like John the Baptist, is going to come and warn people. This isn't a, hey, happy to see you, John. What you been up to? You know, how's it going? This isn't the way that these things are done. So the fact is, is that he comes with a warning to warn people that they better be ready and be prepared and make their path straight because the kingdom is near and you need to be prepared. It's about preparation. 
This isn't a high five, you're here type of thing. And it's the same thing that we see when people deal with God. You know, most of the people who we have written of in the Word that have come face to face with God, or even as messengers, have been terrified, thinking they were going to die, thinking they were unworthy and and in fear for their lives. And we don't get this concept that, hey, it's just going to be stroll on up and boy, you know, if God lived among us, we just roll up to the temple whenever we wanted and we do all this. The high priest, one of the holiest people, the most set apart people in all of Israel, the person who's probably in some ways closer to God than anybody else, is told, don't come at all times into the holy place lest you die. Now why would he do that to the person who brings the sacrifice of the children of Israel, who's wearing the holy set of our garments, who's got all these things and is this special person, why would he tell that person that he better be careful about when he comes close to God in the holy place because he might die. His life is on the line if he makes the wrong choice. How is that in contrast to how people treat God and how people think of God and think of Mashiach and Messiah and, and the King of Kings? They think that they're not being careful with their own life and and Messiah, he's called the Word. He's called the Truth. Right? He's the life. Right? He is life. The truth is life. And yet we're not careful with him or ourselves coming into his presence. And a lot of people get way too familiar in their own minds. And I see that as foolishness. That's like Nadav and Avihu running up and just doing whatever they want. All of a sudden the presence of God comes down and they think, hey, great, now we can do whatever we want. And they are killed on the spot, the high priest's sons, for acting in a way that wasn't appropriate in the presence of God. And we see this all through the scriptures. This is the pattern that we have. I know that in many people's minds they've made up this idea of this, this, you know, sweet Jesus with the lamb on his shoulder and the kids come up to him and hey, everyone's just gathering around and pull out the guitar and the tambourine and look at what a great moment we're having. And I don't think they respect and give it the seriousness and give him the respect that he deserves in that it was a life and death situation when these people did it. Even if they did it ignorantly, you know, the woman who, who, who touched the hem of his robe, you know, that that's a serious situation if you understand who you're touching. You don't have any place touching him or doing what you want around him. It just doesn't work like that. It's like the concept of light and darkness. Light, it pushes out the darkness. It casts out darkness. That's what a little bit of light can cast out a lot of darkness. You see? It's not like light comes in and darkness smothers out the light. We don't see that. It's the opposite. It's light that casts out the darkness. And Messiah is the light of the world. And so what do you think he's going to do? What do you think it means when it says, Many come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord. And he says, get away from me, I never knew you. See what he's doing? He's casting them, get away, is to cast out you who do lawlessness, you who break the law. He is the Torah keeper. He is the example of perfect obedience. That's all he's ever done was obey. And when you come at him and he's clean and righteous and has righteous works, and when you come at him with your filth and your sin and your wickedness, and your ignorance, right? What's going to happen to darkness? Those things are darkness. What's going to happen when darkness approaches the light? Is darkness going to push away the light? Is darkness going to be joined to light so that the light becomes darkness? Is it going to become like half light, half dark? Are you going to just blend with Messiah? I mean, you got to think about these things. The reality is no. 
the light is going to cast out the darkness. So for all the people who think they're just going to run up being darkness and, and join to the light and surround the light and think that they're going to be able to stay there as they are and approach as they are, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. So you have to realize that the great holiness of God it, it melts away the uncleanness, right? It purges it. It casts it away. And if you're full of wickedness, what do you think is going to happen to you? I mean, so many people are like, oh, hey, you know, he loves you just the way you are. You just come up and he's going to be great. And I'm thinking, no, his holiness is like a fire that is going to consume all that weakness, all that wickedness and uncleanness until all that's left is ashes. You walk by, hey, there's Ted. Ted boldly went to the throne. Ted's now a pile of ashes because Ted was full of wickedness and Ted got totally consumed by the holiness of drawing near to yod There's the remnant of Ted. Hey, what's going on, Ted? Ted's not doing so good. You see, the thing is, is there's patterns in the scriptures. These things don't change. Oh, well, you know, I'm going from the mean Old Testament God, and, and in my mind, I have this nice, happy New Testament Messiah, New Testament God, that is just going to hug me and love me, and just I'll be able to just walk up and do anything I want, no matter what. If you're telling yourself that, first of all, even if that was the case, if he chose, if the king of kings chose to allow you to sit at his table or came over and sat at your table, that's his choice. But to think that you're just going to plop down in his chair, sit on his lap, throw him a high five, or hug it out with him without being told that you can that you could even draw near to him or touch him and think that your life isn't going to be on the line? That's ridiculous. You need to get your head straight and understand the holiness and the awesomeness and, and the honor and the glory that goes with being the son of the living Elohim. Okay? That comes with something. Certainly more respect than earthly kings. And you know what? You aren't running up to the president. You're not dropping into the old, boldly going to the Oval Office whenever you want. Because Secret Service would have you down on the ground. Okay? You're not boldly going to the throne on a puny office in this world. How do you think you'll be with the King of Kings? You think you're going to have that type of access? And that's what this is about. We open up this whole first section, and what's it about? The high priest, who's the model of Mashiach, right, is told... You don't have access, unlimited access. Even though you have the set-apart garments, you are set-apart, you are chosen by God, written of, you're, you're bathed, clothed, have all this stuff. Like, even with all that stuff, you don't just come and go as you please. You don't have full access. And yet people think they have full access to God. And you don't. It just has never worked like that. It doesn't work that way. Just as the scriptures say, if the righteous... <clears throat> are scarcely saved, what then of those who do wickedness? See, people don't listen to those words. They don't believe them. They think, ah, oh, well, you know, but I'm saved, you know, um, because my neighbor or the guy who met me on the bus and he told me about Jesus and uh, and I believed in him and so now, you know, I'm saved and so I'm going to boldly go to the throne. No, you're not. You know, the fact is, is uh, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I could try, like a lot of Messianics, well, I'll try and, you know, obey the Torah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do, you know, some there. But we don't have to, you know, and the, no one could do it all, you know, that's what people say. What a bunch of uh, garbage, what a bunch of lies. First of all, how is it that you think you have a great relationship and total access to the king of the universe when it says, if the righteous are scarcely saved, what then of those who do wickedness? It doesn't mean that those who do wickedness means, oh, well, what then? Uh, then they're probably even more saved? No. means 
even less of the wicked if only a small portion of the righteous are saved then probably hardly any if any of the wicked you see this is what the scriptures and the word of God tells us so people say oh wow I thought it was not by works lest any man boast oh I don't know Messiah multiple times when talking about entering into the kingdom repeatedly refers back to works and righteousness and keeping the commandments and obedience as a measuring stick for whether or not you get into the kingdom or not. So here's another example. It doesn't say if the faithful are scarcely saved, if those who believe are scarcely saved, if those under grace are scarcely saved says if the righteous that's the measuring stick righteousness are scarcely saved righteousness and salvation that is what's being displayed here and what then of those who do wickedness so if you think that doing righteousness doesn't matter which is the same as saying doing wickedness doesn't matter then you're mistaken if you think it doesn't have anything to do with your salvation then you're mistaken because this is how the word of God even the New Testament even if you don't really follow the Old Testament this is all throughout there you're just choosing to ignore it the fact of the matter is every choice you make is dealing with life Moshe, Moses said I set before you life and death choose life okay he just set before him the law, the commandments. Either you're going to obey him, which is going to be life, or you're going to disobey, which is going to be death. Even the scriptures say the wages of sin is death. The New Testament says sin is the transgression of the law. It's the breaking of the law. If sin is death, and sin is breaking the law, then death is breaking the law. And all those people who think that they're following Jesus, or Yeshua, or Yahushua, or however you want to say his name, the fact is is that the reward of life is equal to eternal obedience. Eternal life is eternal obedience. That's what's drawn out in the Old and the New Testament. Sin and death and disobedience, that's on one side. Life and righteousness and obedience is on the other side. And Messiah represents life and righteousness and obedience. And if you want to live with him and be like him and be saved and enter into the kingdom and all of those things over there, that's the side that you have to be on. And anyone who's taught you something differently is lying. They're selling you death instead of life, just like the serpent. What happened? God commanded them, don't eat from that, and the day you eat you will surely die. And some other person came and thought that he would help them reinterpret their word of God by telling them that somehow the word of God uh, doesn't punish you if you disobey, that it wasn't about obeying God, it was actually there was another plan where you don't have to obey God. All this stuff sound familiar? It's the same teachings that go through a lot of Christianity and even among many Messianics who really just have the same old Christian doctrine. They, Out of one side of the mouth they say that they believe in the Torah and that it's important but if you nail them down on it they go, well, it's not really needed for salvation. Well, and then what's more important? Obedience or salvation? Well, salvation. So, so the, the commandments are an afterthought? Obedience is an afterthought? What Moshe said, life, was obeying the commandments and that the blessings the life eternal life Messiah's life and his obedience all of that was an afterthought to something much greater which was to not get punished for your sins look if that's what you want to buy if all you care about is whether or not you get punished for your sins then follow that doctrine because that's what it is it's a what's in it for me it's an I don't care really about God other than I've 
sin and I need my sins forgiven. And so my whole foundation is going to be based around that. What I get. Someone's going to pay my debt. That's the only reason you're here. For many people, that's it. If their sins weren't forgiven them, they wouldn't have interest in this religion. If they were going to get punished for what they did. I mean, what makes you think you should get forgiven for your sins anyway? You did them. I mean, it's like someone who robs a bank and then expects to be let go free. Like, really? You did the crime. What you actually deserve is the time. This isn't hard math. This is simple. You do X, you get you get Y. You know? You did this crime, you get this much punishment. That's how it works. That's the just way to do things. In a straight up system, there's no need for anything outside of that. It's just how it works. You touch the fire, you get burned. But people seem to want the idea that, well, I want to be able to touch the fire and not get burned. That's not what following God is about. Is there room for forgiveness and mercy? Sure. I touched the fire and got burned because I was ignorant. But now I realize that I will never touch that fire again. That's a good reason to ask for the blister to be healed. Because it, you realize it was a mistake. And you don't want to make that mistake ever again. You know? You go to the king and you touch something of the king's and he didn't want you to do that and he was going to put you to death because you touched something that was his that you shouldn't have. And then you plead for your life and say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I will never touch that again. That's a reason to forgive you. Because then the judge can go, you know what? He touched my thing, and that's a death penalty. And by all rights, I should put him to death. But he's not a person who's going, yeah, I touched it. I'll touch it again. Really? Then he'll be put to death. You shouldn't touch it the first time. But to the person who repents, who realizes what a mistake it was, realizes how stupid it was that they did what they did and how they were throwing their life away and playing with life and death situation and made the wrong choice. For that person who repents, they know, coming close to having their life taken away, that they would never want to do go there again. That's repentance. How you doing? May I introduce repentance? Okay? Maybe you've heard of it but never seen what it really is or thought about what it really means. To that person who that action was something they never want to do again and they would hope and, and they're sad that they ever did in the first place, if you destroy them, you destroyed somebody who made a mistake, who wouldn't make that mistake in the future. That's a reason for mercy. You know what? It was a mistake. They know it's a mistake. They're sorry for it. I shouldn't expect them to ever do that. As a matter of fact, they would probably be the last person to ever touch my stuff again because it almost got them killed. That's repentance. That's where mercy and forgiveness comes in. But if it's a straight-up situation of judgment and the person comes in and says, hey, yeah, I can touch it. I touched it, but I can touch it again. It's not a big deal. And I don't think I'm going to die from it. What do you think that king's going to do to someone with that attitude? I think they're going to be put to death. Because that's what they earned. It's not the king being a jerk. It's not harsh. They earned it. They made that choice. They chose death instead of life. When Moshe says, I set before you good and evil, life and death, choose life. It's just choosing to obey. That equals life and blessing. Death is sin or breaking of God's commandments and disobedience. It's that simple. I got in an argument on my wall that went like over 300 comments deep because I said the bold and ridiculous thing, which was we're required to obey God's word. Oh, no. Oh, well, it's not about earning points or uh, earning salvation or being a legalist and blah, 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 blah. Look, if you read that whole book and you didn't figure out that 
the whole thing is we're supposed to obey God from the first story to the last story, then you didn't read the book very well. That's what it's about. That's the basics. If somehow you came up with some other fanciful idea of, well, no, it's really about uh, Messiah or Jesus and, and salvation and you forgive you for your sin, for what? So that you can go on being the same person? What's the point of that? Because then what you got is an earth, right? If God's just going to be like, eh, everyone makes mistakes, no big deal. If that's really how it is, though that's not at all how he's been in the past. As a matter of fact, last time, is that what he did with Noah? Did he just forgive the whole world and say, well, people make mistakes? Or did he kill every living thing on the planet? Animals, baby animals, bugs, people. That doesn't sound... God doesn't change. So you're telling me that that same God who wiped out every living thing because of their wicked deeds and choices, that that's the same one who's just cool with you how you are? You know, hey, I say believe in him. So what? What's that worth if you don't do anything? Nothing? What's that tree worth that produces no fruit? Nothing? It's a waste. It's a waste to consider yourself a follower of God and not obey Him. That's a total waste. What does that even mean? Hey, He's my master, but I don't listen to a word He says. I listen when I want to. Well, then how are you any different than any stranger that's on the street who might listen to you if they want to? You might ask Him, Hey, could you go get me a glass of water? If they feel like it, they will. If they don't, they won't. They're not obligated. That's how a lot of messianics turn around with that stupid theology. Well, we keep the commandments because we are saved. Where did you hear that? Who told you such a stupid thing? You didn't come up with it on your own. You didn't come up with it from the scriptures. You heard it somewhere. And you start repeating things that you hear instead of plugging your brain in and thinking about them and saying, wait a minute, how's that work now? So if the big thing was just this skidding safe thing, and then like the commandments, if I don't have to keep them, then how am I different than anybody else who doesn't keep any of them? You're not. You're not any better or worse than the guy who doesn't believe in God and happened to not have to work on Saturday. Is he keeping the Sabbath because he didn't work that day? Does he get the any bonus points or any any kind of uh, favorable judgment? Is he counted as a Sabbath keeper? Because it wasn't on his schedule for him to work? I don't think so. See, it's just like a few parishes ago when we had the guy, who Naaman, who needed to be healed, and he's told to go bathe in, in the Jordan, the Jordan. And he wasn't satisfied with that. Hey, we've got better rivers in from where I'm from but it wasn't about the water it was about why you're bathing in the water because you believe the authority of God to heal you if you believe that plus didn't matter if you just said you know what I believe that God can heal me I believe he wanted me to to go bathe in in the water to be clean seven times. And my belief's good enough. He knows my heart. I'm not going to actually physically go do what I was told to do because he knows my heart and he knows that I believe in him. You think that person would be healed? No. If you have the belief, you'll do it. Actually doing it proves that you have the belief. Though some people can do things. There's other people who happen to be bathing in the yard and it doesn't mean they believed in God. You have to have the whole package, actually. You have to have the action first and the belief during that action to validate that action. Otherwise, the action alone. This is like what Mashiach taught when he talked to the Pharisees who were physically keeping some of the commandments, but they weren't spiritually keeping them. So he said, none of you keeps the law. They 
we're doing the first part, but that's not actually keeping it. Because the law isn't just physical. The law is spiritual. So it wasn't that they weren't doing anything, but what they were doing wasn't enough to be counted. Because you count it after the second witness. That's when a thing is established. They had the physical witness, which was the first, but they lacked the spiritual witness. Other people come going, hey, well, I got the spiritual witness. You know, Christ is in me, and you know, I'm, it's the spirit of the law, not the letter. I hear these things, and it's like ridiculous the poor logic it is. It's like, do you hear what you are saying? Do you hear yourself? Or does it sound come out and it's totally silent in between your ears? Because if you have the spirit of the law, that would mean that at its very core, you know, just like when it says, when Mashiach says, if you look on a woman with lust, you're guilty of adultery. Right? It's not that you slept with another man's wife. Physically. That is the sin. But if you didn't do it physically, but in your mind, you were lusting after another man's wife then you're guilty. And when you do the physical action, it actually establishes it. Remember the two witness rule. So, better that once you stop doing it physically, that you also stop doing it spiritually. And then you'll have both witnesses to where you are clean from that sin. Whenever the two come together, you're in trouble. And in the case of righteousness, when the two come together for obedience, not just the outward, the physical, the letter of the law, but the spirit as well, then you have truth and true righteousness. So you either have true wickedness or true righteousness. And it has to do with the two witnesses. These two witnesses are important. You see, we have to learn to be careful with life. A lot of people say, oh, well, I have the spirit. So that's a reason to forego the physical? Of course not. You're back to one witness. You still have to have both witnesses. As Mashiach said, if the inside of the you clean the inside of the cup, that the outside may be clean also. Right? What did he say to the Pharisees? Their problem was the inside of the cup was not clean. They had the outward clean. And the inside was dirty. He didn't say, eh, the outside doesn't matter. Let the outside be filthy as long as you clean just the inside. And that's a lot of Christian and Messianic doctrine. They think, oh, well, I just have it spiritually, you know. I don't have to physically do any of the righteous works because I believe in Yeshua. So what? That's one witness. And you should believe in Him that you would also do the other. Right? What did he say about Moshe? If you'd believe Moshe, you'd believe me because he wrote of me. In other words, if you believe that one witness, you'd believe my witness. Because our witnesses are the same. The same truth. That's saying we're not saying something different. If they're saying something different, believing someone else different wouldn't help you in any way understand that. The only time that makes sense in context is if the two witnesses are saying the same thing. Then what he's saying is, doesn't matter if you listen to him or you listen to me. Right? That's what he said. If you would believe Moshe, you would believe me because he wrote of me. <clears throat> and he doesn't say the problem is that you don't believe me or now that you believe me, you don't have to believe Moshe. None of those things that people think are what he said. He actually says the opposite which will also give you an idea of how stupid those theologies are and how they're working as an adversary against the truth. You see, because he said, if you would believe Moshe, you'd believe my words because he wrote of me. But he says, but because you don't believe his words, how can you believe my words? And yet so many people think, well, we got Mashiach, so we don't need Moshe, you know? He's better. He's greater. That's not what Moshe, or Mashiach's saying. He's still including Moshe. He doesn't say, well, now that you're not looking on a woman with lust, it's okay if you sleep with her. 
as long as you're not looking on her with lust. So shut your eyes, go over there, and sleep with another man's wife, and you're good. Right? It doesn't work like that. The fact is, is if you're not looking on her with lust, the inside of the cup is clean. He says, clean the inside that the outside may also be clean. Right? So, it doesn't matter whether you started with the outside of the cup or the inside of the cup. The goal is always the same, to have the whole cup clean. Outside and inside. Both witnesses. See, people aren't careful with life. They're not doing the things... I mean, this is a... They, they simplify. They oversimplify a lot of things. The fact is, is this is a detailed process. You know, dealing with sin. Look at what we see in this week's parish hall. It goes on and on about the details. Okay, here's what you're going to do. Aharon will bathe himself. Then he puts on the holy garments. Then he has to take a bullock for himself. A ram for a burnt offering. Then he's got to bring the two goats, the Azazel and the scape goat, to the door of the tabernacle. Then he's going to cast law. I mean, we're not even, we haven't got anything done yet. But all these details, you have to look at the priest. You have to look at their sin. They do the offering first to handle their sin. They've got to be in the right garments. They have to have their washing. Then you go into the animals. It's not any animal. Animal has to be unblemished. Right? Can't be flawed. The animal can't be flawed. The process of what you do with the animal, what you do with their blood, where it's shed. Where is it sprinkled? What do you do with it afterwards? You just throw it over the curtain? No. You invalidate it. You're going to just uh, make an X on the curtain? Sprinkle a little on your face? Splash it on the ground? No. Every little detail of everybody involved is important. Even the animal that's dying. Even their blood after their death is still under rules and ordinances of how it's to be treated so it's not in vain. That blood is still under guidelines. The animal's dead. Even to the point what they do with their skin and the dung of the animal and everything. And we see it in this week's parish shot. You see the guy who lets the scapegoat go, it tells what he has to do when he comes back. He has to change his clothes. He has to bathe himself. All this stuff and his situation after he does the job that he was supposed to do. Everything's got rules. And there's a detailed process to dealing with this. And you think that being around Messiah, around God, isn't going to include rules and details and the way to act? And it isn't going to be boldly go to the throne and high-five Jesus and whatever you feel like you want to do? It isn't going to work that way. It just never has. The pattern is quite the opposite. It's quite detailed. It's quite strict. It's quite life and death when you're dealing with God and when you're in His presence. It's how this week's parish starts off and it goes all the way through the whole scripture. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. Then it gets into the concept of eating blood and the life is in the blood. And... How serious that is. What you do with the blood. You can even eat an animal. If the animal is if you hunted the animal and it's and it's a clean animal for you to eat, you can eat it. But you can't do whatever you want. You're hungry, you hunted it, now you can just eat it. But see, eating the animal sustains your life. But it says the life is in the blood. And it's that life that you have to be careful of of the animal even though it's actually giving you life, even though you've been uh, uh, commanded and allowed to eat that animal, it isn't anything goes. There's parts of the animal you can't eat. Not only is there parts you can't eat, there's things you have to do with those parts and how you have to do it. You can't just dispose of it how you want. And that's how our life is. Our life is full of rules and ordinances. And the sooner you start to learn those things, the sooner you look at the Word of God and realize 
that there's a lot of rules. There's ordinances and statutes, commandments and judgments. And they all have a place. They're all like threads to the tabernacle that are pinned down and hold every piece in place so that you have the whole thing being solid. Your relationship with God is pinned down by a bunch of details, a bunch of ordinances and a bunch of commandments. It defines and secures and solidifies your relationship with God. And people just flat out teach against that. They're going to say, oh no. He doesn't take anything into account when it comes to our relationship. Really? Because that's not the message you're going to get with God interacting with His people. As a matter of fact, you can just follow them through the Old Testament and see when God dwelt with His people, if something, if they did something offensive or sinful, it directly impacted their relationship with God. Whether God then moved outside the camp, whether God plagued them and punished them and killed them on the spot for their wickedness, everything they did mattered in the relationship to God and impacted it. Now, do you think that's going to change? It isn't going to change. It's the same that it was and it will be the same in the future. And if you go in thinking that it doesn't matter, a.k.a the same teaching of the serpent in the garden. Oh, surely you won't die. No, God said you're going to die. Go back to what happened and what happened first and what God said first. He says, in the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. And the serpent comes in and starts telling him, ah, you're not going to die. You are. You're the serpent. You're the one telling yourself stupid things that are contrary to the word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, you need to study it more. And then once you know it, you need to remember it. The big problem with Israel, they don't remember it. And they don't keep it. And they don't do it. But they may live. And the same messages are being said over and over and over again here. This is how the Scriptures work. This has always been the problem with Israel. This has always been the problem with God's people. And people who aren't God's people doesn't matter. It all comes down to the same things. Why in the world I would have people in an uproar? Can you imagine going to God's people and telling them that they should obey God and they've got a problem with that? The most offensive thing I can say on my timeline on Facebook is that we're required to obey God. If that's the most offensive thing that God's people can hear, then God's people are in some serious bad water. Okay? They're in a serious bad state when the most offensive thing that a person could tell them is that they need to obey God. People unfriended me for saying that. Oh no, you know, you know, they start throwing out grace and mercy and and salvation doctrine and basically all Christian doctrines that they're still holding on to. They're high five Jesus. He loves me the way I am. I'm going to get to go hug him and do whatever I want around him. You know, you're just being a legalist. Oh, those, those rules and things like that. It's not that serious. You know, God knows my heart. All that garbage. All that garbage. Have you not read the Word? Have you not seen that God was not that way with His people before and He won't be that way when He comes back? Do you not take it serious when a person who was put to death for gathering kindling on the Sabbath? That was a serious thing. One day you're out there, you're not treating the Sabbath correctly and boom, you're put to death. Not a, hey, could you just told me, give me another warning... You know, I'll try not to do that in the future. You know my heart. No. You're dead. Because you didn't treat it carefully. You didn't realize that when you were doing those things, you were literally playing with your life. Taking your life into your own hands. So, these are the things. We have to manage life. 
And that, it's everywhere. It's all around us. It's like a husband manages his wife. A woman can be like a garden of life. And just as it says, husbands love your wives, as Mashiach loved the congregation, washing her in the word to present her blameless before the Father. It isn't, well, she's just my wife. Well, she has really good intentions. You know, she really loves me. Where is all that? What we see is hard, practical stuff. He's washing her with the word for a reason. Not, not to say, well, you know what, I washed her with the word. We had Bible studies every Tuesday. You know, that's good enough, and however she is, is going to be good? No. There's a purpose to it, to present her blameless. If she isn't blameless, it doesn't matter how much word she was washed in. See, we've got a lot of people. Ah, I watch this DVD. I got all these Bible movies. I got I got 20 Oives I said this week. I got, look at this Talit from Jerusalem. You know, we had a Passover Seder, you know. There's 300 people there. Who cares? That stuff doesn't mean anything. If it didn't, converts you to be blameless before God. That's just straight up fruit expected to be on the tree. Don't quote me this verse. You know, everybody out there who doesn't know two things about the Word of God, who've got it absolutely wrong and backwards, can quote the Scripture. Don't get impressed with yourself because you can misquote the Scripture. Oh, well, in John it says this, John 3, 16, Galatians 5, 2. Well, in Romans, right, I get on this thread. What are people saying? Oh, well, you know, Romans 10, 3 says this. I don't care what Romans 10, 3 says. That doesn't prove your point unless it proves your point. Quoting Scripture doesn't mean anything in itself. Unless that Scripture is interpreted correctly, in the context of all the scriptures and is accurately interpreted. That's when there's power behind those scriptures. Because people have been arguing opposite sides using similar scriptures. Oh, see? Says, I didn't come to, to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. That's what the people who say he came to do away with the law use. They use the same verse that the other people who are saying, no, it says... He didn't come to do away with it. And they're going, yeah, see? He didn't come to do away with it, to fulfill it. Now it's fulfilled, it's done away with. They're both using the same scripture to prove their point. The difference is, is one had the wrong interpretation of what that scripture meant. Yes, context matters. Yes, the only context of the scriptures is all the scriptures. You see, there's this little thing called truth and lies. Opinions are somewhere in between. You see, we can all have opinions, and they can be kind of right. There's some truth to it. There's a lot of wisdom that has some truth to it, but it doesn't apply in all situations. That's not the same as truth. The Word of God is truth. When you have the truth, that's what it is. That's what it absolutely is and no other thing. It's not kind of that way, usually mostly that way. It applies sometimes, but not always. No. When you have the real truth and you understand what that is, it is the absolute truth. The only way to have that absolute truth is to have the whole truth. There's no partial truth. So either you've read the whole book and understand what he says, what he biblically means when he says, think not that I've come to destroy the Law and the Prophets. So, right away before we get to the second half about what the word fulfill means, if the whole goal, right, if your fruit of your tree, the result is that the law is done away with somehow, even though the very beginning of this verse says, don't think that, too late, you already thought it. You're already guilty. You're already in opposition to God. I don't care how you try and translate the word fulfill to make it work. You already broke the premise of the very beginning of this statement, which was don't think 
that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. That means your answer can't be that fulfill means to do away with the law and the prophets. Okay? This is the problem. People aren't thinking. They're interpreting things any way they want. They're not being careful with the words of life. And they're not being careful with their own life. Because if this is really, you know, if this is really about your eternal life or death, the damnation of your soul or eternal life, I would think people would study it a little more. I would also think that they would double check and make sure they weren't wrong. That's something that's one of the rarest things that I've seen in all the years that I've been messianic. I don't see people arguing with their own theories. I don't see people testing their own theories and double checking and making sure they didn't get it wrong. I don't see people going, you know what? I think this is right, but here's the ten ways that I could be wrong. And here's what would happen if I was wrong. I don't see that type of balanced thought. And I would think that if your life was on the line, you'd make sure. You wouldn't kind of say, yeah, it's probably about right. I think it said boldly go to the throne. I'm probably good. <laughs> Burned up on the spot. I wouldn't be thinking I'm probably good. I'd be double checking. I'd be looking at the patterns and go, wait a minute. Now it says we can boldly go to the throne, but the high priest was told don't come at all times into the holy place lest he die. And he's more holy and set apart than I ever am. Now if he could die by going at the wrong time, what makes me think I, who am not written in this book, can boldly go to the throne? Am I sure I'm understanding the context of what that means and when that would apply? Hmm. Before I boldly go to that throne, where it looks like in the history of God, he kind of kills people who act stupid around him, maybe I'll double check. and Have I checked out what that word means? Have I looked at the sentence? Have I read the whole chapter? Do I understand what that means? And even if I think it means that, does the bulk of the Bible continuously tell another story? Because I'm going to go with the bulk of the Bible and the patterns that I know God has not been that way. If God never lets you boldly go to the throne, then I'm going to go ahead and just say, do I? am I required to boldly go to the throne? No, I don't think I'm required to. And if it looks like here, it kind of seems like could get me killed and be unpleasing to God. It says this over here, maybe it means that. But just to be safe, since I'm not commanded to, I'm going to go ahead and opt out on the boldly go into the throne. Not sure what it means. Looks like it probably shouldn't. So I'm just going to just say no for that one. I don't need to boldly go to the throne. Who am I that I should boldly go to the throne? I'll sit out here. Maybe I'll watch a couple other people boldly go to the throne. If they don't get burned up, maybe I can go boldly to the throne. But see, that's cautiousness and carefulness because you know that you only get one nanosecond to make that choice before you're dead. That's respect. When you respect God and that God's holy, you realize that you're dealing with life and death when you interact with Him. And you treat it with respect. Now what I see is a lot of people doing a lot of things. They're, they're taking a lot of easy paths. They're not being very diligent in studying. They're, you know, in a, it was funny in that whole post, one gal said one thing, and then another gal was like, Amen, sister. I agree. And I, and the first gal quoted some verses, or said that Messiah had said some things that I'm pretty sure he didn't say. I looked for those verses. I've read the whole Bible. I still look. I want to be sure. I want to double check. I want to do my due diligence. So I asked the gal, can you tell me where Messiah said, you know, if the Torah was enough that he wouldn't need to come? He didn't say that. She might have thought he meant that from things that he said. She might have thought that that that's what he said when it was really something she interpreted from somebody else who didn't say it, who wasn't Messiah, because she ended up posting a verse from Paul. 
fact is, Messiah didn't say that. And when you're talking about the word of God, you better speak correctly. You can't come and say, hey, the king said this. Well, he didn't say that. It'd be your head that'd be getting cut off. You don't lie in the name of the king. We don't... In, in countries that have kings, that's been the standard for thousands of years. Right? That probably would have got you put to death. Those are just earthly kings. You think the king of kings is going to be less than the earthly kings or more? See, the fact is, is then I asked the second gal, could you please produce the verses where Messiah said that? Because you said, Amen, and I agree, you're substantiating these verses. Yet neither that gal, nor the gal who was saying Amen to her, could produce that verse. Because he didn't say it. And this is how uncareful with things you are. Oh yeah, I agree with you. Do you? Have you studied it out? Have you looked at the words? When you say you're quoting something that the Messiah said, can you point to that verse and show where he said it? And just because you point to the verse doesn't actually mean that's what he meant. But if you can't even find a verse and you're making up verses, it's just like, you know, how much further away are you? How much more should you not say something? How much more should you be worried that you misspoke about the word of God and maybe led other people astray who never read my comment that required you to prove it when you couldn't. Maybe they came in, read it, and said, hey, hey, that sounds good. They go off with the horrible theology. Now they're going to tell somebody else, hey, yeah, Messiah said that. They don't know, and they didn't even get to see you corrected. Part of the reason why I actually sit there and go 300 comments deep and, and waste my day instead of working on things and doing things, you know, messages or something, you know, Bible study that could help me and help others. That gobbled up my whole day arguing. I didn't do it for them. I did it for everybody else who comes along and hears these type of things, that they can see the pattern and they can learn and they can watch and see how people said things that were later disproven, were later weren't substantiated that came out saying one thing, like one guy, a great example, it's all lessons that we can learn in life. One guy came in and he was arguing the point uh, with me about, about obedience uh, leading to salvation. And, and then another guy came in arguing the same point. But then the second guy started saying some stuff that was so wacky they were in agreement together at first. And then the guy started saying stuff so wacky that the other guy had to step away and join me in saying, ah, you know, for a minute they were high-fiving like, yeah, I agree, yeah, that's not right, blah, blah, blah. And then the guy started, and then I'm like, make them prove it. And I said, okay, why, why are you saying that? Where does it say that? What does that mean? Define it. Next thing you know, the guy's saying God doesn't keep the letter of the law. The other guy looks and goes, no, nah, I'm pretty sure God keeps the letter of his law. That's like even the Pharisees were keeping the letter but not the spirit. So is, is God, the creator of the universe, less, than the Pharise less righteous than the Pharisees? According to Mashiach, he wouldn't be allowed to be entered into the kingdom because he says unless your righteousness ex exceeds that of the Pharisees, you'll no way enter in the kingdom. Pretty sure God keeps the letter of the law. It was just a wacky statement to make. So the guy was sitting there in agreement like, hey, yeah, amen. Until you realize, as this guy starts to define what he's actually saying and believes, the other guy goes, whoa, I can't go with you on that. That should be a warning to the other guy that, hey, if part of the stuff that I was in agreement with him all of a sudden goes into total wacky tobacco over here, then maybe I need to rethink what I was in agreement with him there because maybe the part that we were in agreement is just as bad and I don't realize it. You see, that's about being cautious and careful. Just like the other one. Hey, amen, sister. Yeah. Tell him. Set him straight. School that guy. Oh, school that guy? If you're going to school me, please don't quote verses that don't exist. And don't say Messiah said something that he never said. 
that's kind of the basics. At least misinterpret words of Messiah like other people do, but don't make up quotations that don't exist. I've read the Bible. Doesn't mean I know everything. I know enough when someone tells me Messiah said X. I can pretty much recall the words of countless hours of and years of study of the Master's words to know, mm, he didn't say that. And even if I didn't, wasn't sure, since I've read the entire Bible and studied the entire context of the Bible, I can tell you there's a hundred ways that that violates the patterns in the Torah. So I'm going to even, even if I wasn't sure, I'd probably throw out and say, nah, I'm pretty sure not, but let me go double check. That's how it works. So stop high-fiving and amen. And stop throwing out quoting verses that were never said. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about being careful with what you believe, what you're staking your faith on, what you're staking your life on. It's about being careful with life. It's all those little details and ordinances that you careful. Okay, now we got the right animal and it was the right thing and I was washed and dressed in my garments and I'm the right priest to do this, but now i got to be careful what I do with this blood. It's got to go in a certain place and a certain thing and be dumped in a certain place and i got to do all this and that. And every step of the way, you're careful. That's how God, when we interact with God, that's how it has to be. That's how the people who interact with God have to be. And yet when it comes to the Word of God, people aren't acting like that. So these are the things that you need to be thinking about and paying attention to. Managing life. How we manage our wife. How we manage our children matters. It's not just about, oh, I hunted that animal, it's mine. No. It's God's. And you're allowed to eat it if it's kosher animal according to the statutes and ordinances that God's laid out. And then, even if it is, there's still rules with how you deal with the blood and what you can do and what you can't do. And you are always God's servant in everything that you do. So you better be aware of what the rules are and how they apply to you at all times. You don't get to take over and do what you want. It doesn't work like that. They may be your children. They're also the children of God. And you have a responsibility as their shepherd and as their protector and their father. You have a whole bunch of rules and ordinances and things and you better be thinking about those things as well. You know, God gives you a child and you neglect them and don't do enough Torah study with them or do all this and that. You're responsible. He gave those to you just like the parable of the talent. Not only did he, the guy just come back and go, here, here it is, you gave this to me. He didn't just go, yeah, I would have rather you did something with it. He took it away from him. And then he punished that servant. So it isn't just, whatever I bring back is okay. If I don't bring back anything, I didn't harm it. No, there's expectations. There's expectations of profit and of fruit. For ourselves, for our others and for the Word of God that we've been given and the blessing that it is in our lives. It is life. And our choices can be life or death. And what we have to do is be very careful with everything in life. Till next time, I'm going to say Shalom.